Metropolitan Chicago is one of the most religiously diverse areas in the world, and for more than a half century, Sanctuary has reported and reflected on our faith-filled community. Sanctuary tells stories of faith from both inside our houses of worship to the streets and neighborhoods where faith is acted out every day with acts of kindness and concern. From food pantries to peace initiatives, from worship services to servicing the poor, Sanctuary has a proud history of reporting on the goodness that flows from our faith traditions. Watch Sanctuary every Sunday at 12 noon. Next up on Sanctuary, a conversation with a new leader in the Chicago faith community and a chance to say goodbye to another leader gone too soon. to Sanctuary, bringing you conversation and stories at the intersection of life and faith. This edition of Sanctuary is produced in cooperation with the Council of Religious Leaders of Metropolitan Chicago. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Sanctuary. I'm Nissan Chavkin, Executive Director of the Council of Religious Leaders of Metropolitan Chicago. Our region is home to many different faith communities. Some have their origins on this continent, and some were brought here by immigrants. Each has its own history and traditions, and many have venerable hierarchies of leadership. Today on Sanctuary, we will get to know a new faith leader in Chicago. We also will remember an outstanding faith leader and a great champion of interfaith dialogue who died earlier this year. Our guest today with me is His Grace the Right Reverend Daniel, Bishop of Chicago in the Midwest for the Diocese of the Midwest and the Orthodox Church in America. Bishop Daniel was enthroned on October 1st as the 12th Hierarch of Chicago and the Diocese of the Midwest. Bishop Daniel, welcome to Sanctuary and welcome to Chicago. Thank you, it's, it's good to be here. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm glad you got here before the snow got here, so you're safe. Uh, well, everyone <laughs> is telling me that, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> you are not originally from here. Could you just tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from and uh, what you bring to our city? Certainly, I, I grew up in California uh, and spent most of my life there. Uh, most recently, I've been living in Phoenix for the last 16 years mm -hmm. as the uh, rector, parish pastor of a, of a, a parish there, and as uh, also serving as the auxiliary bishop of the Diocese of the West of the Orthodox Church in America for the last eight years. Terrific. And I was elected to be the bishop of Chicago and the Midwest uh, on July 18th um, by our Holy Synod of Bishops and uh, to uh, fill in the spot that was the vacancy that was left by my predecessor, Archbishop Paul uh, of Blessed Memory, who reposed in April. Uh, uh, and actually he died on Orthodox Easter. So wow. uh, a beautiful day to, to leave this life to enter the, the next. Wow, well, and uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's kind of a transition, right? To go from parish, parish leader to running a whole diocese, no? Or, or that auxiliary bishop was sort of useful practice? <laughs> yes, kind of both, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, auxiliary bishop, I was certainly involved in administration of the diocese, and I have a history uh, of being involved in church administration anyway, um, and I also loved parish life. Uh, parish life, uh, transitioning to being a diocesan bishop, benefits because uh, I know what the priests and the faithful in the parishes are experiencing. Mm -hmm. I have a, a long history in, in parish ministry, so I think it's beneficial uh, rather than uh, something that uh, causes any difficulties. Great. Well, this is our season here in Chicago for new coaching staffs and all sorts of that, <laughs> so I'm glad you're here and looks like you're off to a good start. How big Thank is you. our diocese here? You're the Bishop of Chicago, but also of the Midwest. What is the Midwest Diocese? Well, the Midwest, yeah, the How Midwest, big is it? Midwest Diocese of the Orthodox Church in America is comprised of 11 states, the Midwest, okay. uh, going as far west as the Dakotas, although we have a small presence there. Uh, we have uh, over 75 parishes, mm -hmm. uh, and the number of priests exceeds 100. Mm -hmm. uh, we only have two monasteries, uh, but a lot of uh, lay involvement, a lot of uh, various types of ministries of outreach and so on and so forth. Uh, so it is a big territory to cover. Uh, and, and one of the things that we love uh, in the Orthodox Church uh, is to have parish visits. So 
the bishop tries to visit his parishes as often as possible. But with 75 or more, uh, uh, yeah. it doesn't make it an annual event. Right. Um, so, uh, but I've already begun that, uh, visiting parishes. Um, the, the diocese, and actually Chicago specifically, uh, the oldest Orthodox church here, or Orthodox community and church, uh, is at Holy Trinity Cathedral, the our diocesan cathedral. Mm -hmm. There's been a pre an Orthodox presence here, as you said, uh, mostly comprised of immigrants uh, from the 1870s or so, maybe before that probably, but um, the records begin in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then uh, continued and continues to grow. Um, not so much with immigration, although the descendants of those immigrants, those initial immigrants, are uh, largely orthodox, uh, but we also have a great outreach to people that are looking for something mm -hmm. uh, from other churches in particular. Um, so we have a great number of particularly Protestant uh, converts mm -hmm. to the Orthodox Church, and we're, we're building, um, uh, building up the, the whole missionizing, uh, uh, a missionizing project program for the, uh, the non-church especially. Cool. So, yeah. And it's such a glorious building, the cathedral is Louis Sullivan and one of our great architectural treasures as a city, and indeed in the country, it's just a glorious space. It, it is, it really is a beautiful church. It's interesting that I'm here today because we just celebrated the Divine Liturgy. Today is the 105th anniversary of the martyrdom of St. John of Chicago, who was the hmm. priest who built that cathedral. He was, he was from Russia, he worked with Louis Sullivan in, in building that cathedral. He was from Russia originally. He came here and uh, brought his family here. Uh, he was very involved in education and outreach and uh, trying to, to preach the gospel to America. Mm -hmm. um, eventually he was recalled to Russia and he was uh, assigned as the, the dean of St. Catherine uh, Cathedral outside of Moscow in the town that's called uh, Zarskoy Selo, mm -hmm. which literally means Tsar's Zar, village. It's where the, the, a lot of the uh, nobility and aristocracy had their homes outside of St. Petersburg. And on this day, uh, 105 years ago, after serving the, the divine services in the cathedral, uh, the Bolsheviks came and pulled him out, took him out into the countryside and shot him uh. Uh, because they uh, obviously were opposed to the influence of the church and society and so on and so forth. Um, so this is a very important day uh, for us because here the, in Chicago uh, there are still descendants of people who are ministered to by St. John. I spoke wow. with a gentleman yesterday, his father was baptized as an infant um, by St. John. And uh, so not only does he have the legacy of having built that beautiful cathedral, uh, but also a very uh, strong spiritual legacy as well. Wow. What, now, and when they came to Chicago, did they come from which direction? <laughs> well, he, he came through New York. He came through New York. Yeah, okay. yeah. At 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 that time, the uh, it's interesting. The church leadership uh, of the Orthodox Church has kind of migrated through the years, beginning in Alaska, actually, mm -hmm. with the uh, missionaries who went there in 1794, then eventually down to San Francisco, and uh, uh, Patriarch Saint Tikhon, who was the Archbishop in America, eventually elected Patriarch of Moscow when he returned to Russia, but he was, he was in San Francisco and he saw the need of immigrants being largely uh, coming from the uh, from New York area. So he transferred the, the offices to New York at that so point. Been so shifting east. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Grace. We're going to pause here for a moment and then we are going to return to our conversation. Uh, and in that process, uh, talk a little about what you envision uh, in your new position here as Bishop of the Diocese of Chicago and Midwest. So we'll be back after just a quick break. Metropolitan Chicago is one of the most religiously diverse areas in the world, and for more than a half century, Sanctuary has reported and reflected on our faith-filled community. 
Sanctuary tells stories of faith from both inside our houses of worship to the streets and neighborhoods where faith is acted out every day with acts of kindness and concern. From food pantries to peace initiatives, from worship services to servicing the poor, Sanctuary has a proud history of reporting on the goodness that flows from our faith traditions. Watch Sanctuary every Sunday at 12 noon. Welcome back to Sanctuary. I'm Nissan Chafkin, and I'm speaking today with His Grace the Right Reverend Daniel, Bishop of Chicago in the Midwest for the Diocese of the Midwest, the Orthodox Church in America. And Your Grace, we've been talking about the church's origins here in, in Chicago and its origins in the United States, but what if you were, I, I put it this way, what should people know who are unfamiliar with the Orthodox Church in America? What should they know about the church? And, and you as a new bishop, I'm sure you have some thoughts and plans of what you'd like to accomplish. What, are, what do you see as sort of things you want to do here uh, in the diocese? Well, I think that the, the principal thing is what the church has done from the very beginning, and that is to preach the gospel, mm -hmm. to, you know, to announce the, the good news of salvation uh, in Jesus Christ. And uh, the challenge of that is uh, the time in which we live. But that's always been the challenge for the church. Mm -hmm. How do you preach the gospel in a, in a given society at a given point in history? So that's our primary goal, and, and is to preach the gospel. Uh, I found here in the Diocese of the Midwest that there is uh, a significant missionary uh, energy or enthusiasm for, for missions uh, and uh, something that's taken place in the past and something that we want to focus on as we move into the future as well, mm -hmm. to establishing missions, to being present in places where people are looking for Christ, mm -hmm. looking for the church. Uh, and as I said earlier, a lot of non-churched or unchurched people. Uh, uh, we have a lot of our priests themselves are converts. Mm -hmm. And so they're able to, they know what people are going through in terms of searching for a faith that resonates with them. And uh, so we're blessed with, with the priests for sure in terms of that experience. And, and how, do we, how do we speak the gospel? How do we remain faithful to the gospel in this point in history here in this corner uh, of the vineyard? Mm -hmm. And does that form, does that outreach or form, is it a function of, uh, in terms of ministering to particular populations, the poor, the vulnerable, does it, is it through liturgy? It's probably all of the above, but is there a particular emphasis? And your liturgy is in English? English, yes? okay. mostly. Uh, by and large, most of our parishes use exclusively English. Mm -hmm. But we have, we have parishes as well that are uh, at least bilingual, using uh, not Russian, but uh, or Ukrainian, or but Church Slavonic, mm -hmm. uh, which is a form of well, it's an ancient liturgical language. Um, uh, but we, um, in, in terms of how we do the outreach, it really is all of the above, as you said. Liturgy is very attractive. Our, our our services are sung, and they're sung a cappella, mm -hmm. and uh, they're very rich in terms of uh, the senses. You know, hearing, smelling, seeing, tasting, you know, all the senses are used at one point or another, or uh, taken advantage of at one point or another. So we have people that are drawn primarily because of the liturgy. Mm -hmm. but we, uh, we also have people who are drawn because of the history of the church. They're looking mm -hmm. for the ancient church. We also have people that are drawn because of community, uh, a local parish community they find mm -hmm. very inviting and hospitable. But we also do outreach um, to the poor, to, the, to those who are homeless, for example, even here in Chicago. It's throughout the diocese, but in Chicago, Holy Trinity Cathedral does a significant outreach to the homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do that just for the sake of, that's one way to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. We don't expect people to come in the door uh, because we fed them, um, but it's something that we're, we're obliged to do by our, because of our faith. Mm -hmm. And so that's an important aspect of, of our life and ministry as well. And as you uh, extend the mission of the church, do you see it uh, going in a particular, uh, do you have a sense, I know you're new to town, but is there a direction that seems to be helpful or profitable or that looks uh, meeting any particular underserved needs that you're sort of doing extra focus on? Well, in, in addition to, uh, to you know, social uh, 
mm -hmm. addressing social needs. Uh, what I find, and this isn't just here in Chicago, but actually in our parishes throughout the United States, that post-COVID, interestingly enough, we have a lot of young people showing themselves, mm -hmm. presenting themselves at the door of the church. Uh, it's, it's a phenomena, and you know, I, I think that you know, through COVID, everyone, everyone kind of went through a, a sense of you know, meeting their mortality. Mm -hmm. And I think that for a lot of our young people, it was the first time ever having to address the question of mortality. Mm -hmm. They're looking for answers. Mm -hmm. And so they come to church looking for answers. So we have a lot of young people in our churches by and large. And are you, are they doing, uh, like in my congregation we have, we have study programs, we have social programs, we have uh, social action programs. Mm -hmm. So there's the people who want to think, the people who want to do, the people who want to pray, the people who want to be just go to the football game together, which, mm -hmm. which seems well, to be uh, catching uh, them, you know? Again, it's all of the above. All of those, okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, people are looking for community mm -hmm. uh, to begin with. Young people are looking for a healthy community. They're mm -hmm. kind of over the, uh, the, the scene, if you will, you uh -huh. know, that so many young people live in, and uh, they're looking for something more. So they come together, and uh, they, they, they're educated, they're, social, you know, they, they're given social opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, they're given service opportunities. Uh, so it's really a wonderful, it's really uh, uh, an uplifting thing to witness mm -hmm. how the Lord's working you know, in, in their lives. And then mm -hmm. the church is there to, to help them uh, and to meet their needs. So um, by way of a close, uh, is, is Chicago really the, the uh, do we have a lot of people here as our sort of focus of the Orthodox Church in the diocese, or, are they, or is, your, is everyone sort of scattered evenly throughout the, the diocese? Well, there's a higher percentage of Orthodox in general in Chicago than mm -hmm. anywhere else in the Midwest. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but that would include also other, other, well, it's the one Orthodox Church, but as is expressed in Greek Orthodoxy or Romanian Orthodoxy mm -hmm. or Russian Orthodoxy, um, so there is a high percentage of uh, 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 an Orthodox population here. Got it. Uh, we ourselves have a significant presence too in this area, a number of parishes. Terrific. So, uh, and, and again, it's both historic because of history, but also because of the work of the church now. Exciting. First of all, thank you, uh, Your Grace, for this information, this excitement, um, and welcome to our city. Thank you very much. In a moment, uh, after this break, we'll come back and pay tribute to a man who was a great leader for all the faith communities here in the city of Chicago. Metropolitan Chicago is one of the most religiously diverse areas in the world, and for more than a half century, Sanctuary has reported and reflected on our faith-filled community. Sanctuary tells stories of faith from both inside our houses of worship to the streets and neighborhoods where faith is acted out every day with acts of kindness and concern. From food pantries to peace initiatives, from worship services to servicing the poor, Sanctuary has a proud history of reporting on the goodness that flows from our faith traditions. Watch Sanctuary every Sunday at 12 noon. We close this episode of Sanctuary with the remembrance of a remarkable man. The very Reverend Thomas A. Bema was for many years the vicar for ecumenical and interreligious affairs for the Archdiocese of Chicago. As vicar, Tom served as expert advisor for the Archbishops of Chicago, representing them liturgically and speaking as the public voice of the Archdiocese in ecumenical and interreligious settings. At the same time, he also served as provost for the University of St. Mary of the Lake, the seminary for the Archdiocese of Chicago. Tom was also an active member and past president of our organization, the Council of Religious Leaders of Metropolitan Chicago. The Council is one of Tom's great legacies. He shaped what we do, how we work together, and why we keep going. Like all who knew Father Bema, we miss him greatly. Here is a short tribute to his full life of service and love.
Many of you are here, we're blessed to know him and work with him. In fact, as I look around the room, I can see that I met many of you, most of you through him, through his graciousness and seeing you as friends and colleagues and representatives of the interreligious and ecumenical communities with whom you worked with him so well. We're grateful for the relationships and the support that you gave him. And uh, while we mourn his loss, and I heard from some of you this evening, words of condolences, I want to offer my sympathy and condolences to all of you for having lost a good friend. In Chicago Jewish Magazine, Rabbi Pukko wrote, Father Bema sought to understand Jews and Judaism as we understand ourselves. He would regularly inquire about our understanding of this or that verse in the Torah, or this or that passage in rabbinic literature. Indeed, he was so trusted a friend and colleague that when the Jewish community had to develop documents to present to a variety of Christian denominations, we could always count on sharing the drafts with him and on receiving his best advice. He never failed us. What you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. That captures my feelings for our dear departed friend, Father Tom Bema. For his impact has indeed been woven into so many lives, including mine. God of mercy, God of grace, hear us as we say the name of your servant, Father Bema. Let your love that move throughout his life continue to move through us today. Where there is sorrow, bring comfort. Where there is weariness, supply hope. And where there are questions, provide solutions. Lord, inspire a new generation of leaders who understand that the road to ecumenical dialogue and fellowship is paved with patience, love, and kindness. Amen. You'll realize that I'm not just a representative of the Episcopal Diocese, but you can probably all pick up from my accent the fact that I'm English. And my attention has therefore been rather taken by a rather significant funeral in my mother country. And the outpourings of reminiscence and affection for Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth all speak of someone who, by the very nature of constitutional monarchy, was in one sense the ultimately powerless person. She couldn't do anything. That was for elected members of the government and, and the British Parliament. But she wielded, of course, quite remarkable influence. And it was quite plain that the millions that have mourned her recognise the sudden absence of somebody who helped draw community together. Those two events and the sentiments they represent prepare me well to stand here and give thanks for the ministry of Father Tom Bamer. He was somebody who understood the value of drawing communities together and exercised, as we all know, many of you much better than I do, exercised remarkable wisdom, subtlety, honesty, and insight as he worked tirelessly for the one God in drawing as many people as he could together to a common vision, a challenge and an inspiration, I think, for all of us that are people of faith in an increasingly complicated era. I really loved him, and I know all of you did too. He was just a beautiful human being, 
and we came together in the name of the Buddhist Catholic dialogue. Me and Asayo being two of the representatives. There's other ones here. But at the end of the day, he was just my friend. Together, as Father Tom showed us by his example, with his words, his kindness, his compassion, his humor, his joy. Tonight, together, we stand in harmony. We stand in respect for one another. We stand in understanding, and we stand in peace. Tom was a colleague, a scholar, advisor, pastor, mentor, and friend. Tom was a respected priest and a great example of what it means to be a Christian. He modeled dialogue, friendship, by always treating others with generosity, warmth, and respect. Thanks to our guest is Grace Bishop Daniel of the Orthodox Church in America. Our thanks as well to the Archdiocese of Chicago for sharing their moving tribute to the very Reverend Thomas A. Bema, Vicar for Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs. A reminder that the Council of Religious Leaders of Metropolitan Chicago will hold its annual Interfaith Thanksgiving Observance at 12 noon on Wednesday, November 23rd at First United Methodist Church at the Chicago Temple, 77 West Washington, across from Daly Plaza. All are welcome. For more information, visit the website which appears on your screen. Until our next time together, good health and peace. Metropolitan Chicago is one of the most religiously diverse areas in the world, and for more than a half century, Sanctuary has reported and reflected on our faith-filled community. Sanctuary tells stories of faith from both inside our houses of worship to the streets and neighborhoods where faith is acted out every day with acts of kindness and concern. From food pantries to peace initiatives, from worship services to servicing the poor, Sanctuary has a proud history of reporting on the goodness that flows from our faith traditions. Watch Sanctuary every Sunday at 12 noon 